Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to our uh, seminar on urban resilience, utopia or reality. My name is Maria Angelica Sotomayor. I'm one of the practice managers for water in Africa for the World Bank. And it's a pleasure to be here today with my colleague, Alexandros. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Alexandros Makarigakis. I am the global coordinator for UNESCO on issues of water for human settlements. Uh, welcome to our seminar, a seminar that will showcase how individual cities in Africa, Asia, Europe, and Latin and North America have built resilience to future shocks and stresses and increased uncertainty and the role of stakeholders at different levels. We aim to, to see how a paradigm shift is imperative to adopt what, at water set, water set level integrated approach to be able to respond better to the challenges that climate change is bringing to our water sector and the other sectors who require water for their needs. But water resilience can mean different things to different people. Uh, Maria Angelica, what does urban water resilience mean to you? Uh, well, given that it, we're talking about urban water resilience, uh, we first need to ensure to uh, deliver universal access to services for an urban population that in most of our countries around the world is growing, uh, putting extra stress on uh, often uh, not reliable sources of water. Um, and of course, in, we know climate change is only exacerbating uh, the risks and the, and the shocks that uh, utilities or other service providers face. And uh, we will have the opportunity to uh, talk about um, issues of drought in mega cities like uh, Cape Town or Sao Paulo. Uh, that are uh, have these uh, droughts uh, jeopardizing the services to their population. Um, but uh, excess of water is also an issue uh, that often comes with water quality problems. And I, I, the, the biggest challenge, I, I think, is uh, how to um, continue expanding services uh, in the midst of all these um, disasters. What do you think, Alexandro, can I be com done? I completely agree with you. Uh, these are uh, major issues that uh, are, need to be addressed uh, due to the global challenges. Uh, I believe that we have to start looking more at integrated urban water management uh, solutions. We need to start thinking about a nexus approach on, for sustainable development. Uh, like you said, services are our primary focus, let's say. So uh, issues like smart water management systems, which help you minimize your losses, which means also that you require less water and less energy to provide the service that you want to your people, uh, are an important topic that needs to be um, at least researched and implemented on the ground. But uh, as you said, it, it's not only about the reduction of the amount of water that we have, right? Uh, it's not only about the drought, it's also about the excess amount. So what do we do in a flood situation? And we're lucky to have a, a seminar that will give us uh, this angle. Yes. I'm very excited to hear about our champions. We have a very exciting uh, list of um, presenters that will be uh, sharing uh, their experiences in their cities, um, both in developing world, but also what others in, in um, more advanced uh, circumstances have been able to, to do to uh, deal with these issues. So um, looking forward to the, to the seminar. We, we will have three sessions, so and I, we hope you will stay with us throughout 
uh, this week and learn about uh, what other cities um, are doing to address this. And hopefully we will conclude that it's a reality. Exactly that. Uh, I, I, our first session starts with uh, the Global Resilient Champions. We're going to hear from mayors. We're going to hear from uh, managers of major water utilities around the world. Uh, as Maria Angelica said, from both developing and developed nations. And the, this session will be followed by the critical factors of influencing resilience today. And last but not least, we will have regional time ta uh, round tables that will uh, provide us the different views on the issues that have been discussed by regions. We are looking forward to having some uh, active participation by all of our audience. So please, uh, I would like to echo Maria Angelica's call for staying with us the whole week and participating in all uh, sessions of this seminar. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Cristina Arango and I am the CEO at the Water and Sewerage Company of Bogota. Our mission is to provide water to Colombia's capital city and neighboring municipalities. Serving this population, around 10 million people, entails mounting challenges, particularly in the face of profound external shocks such as climate change and the current pandemic. Amidst these challenges, the World Water Week posits a very pertinent question. Is water resilience attainable? I want to say that I believe it is, but isolated efforts are not enough. We must all do our bit. Our company has been undertaking structural changes to follow the pace of the major transformations that the water sector demands. These efforts have been consolidated in a strategy dubbed a sustainable modernization, which relies on five components. First, building citizenship culture. Since attaining urban water resilience demands a societal challenge, there's an urgent need for collective action. To push these changes, we're working on cultural and behavioral transformations, both internally and externally. More particularly, we have been working on the concept Somos Agua, which loosely translates into We Are Water, an effort to tackle people's beliefs regarding their relationship with water. Through it, we are aiming at discouraging harmful behaviors such as littering in wetlands and rivers and carelessly disposing of oils and fats and of sanitary waste in the sewerage infrastructure. On a more technical side, we use innovative approaches to measuring and assessing climate threats, which pose significant risk to our operation. For example, we are devoting important resources to increase research on the impact of deforestation in the Amazon on water availability in the Shingasa water supply system. We've also built a robust hydrometeorological network to count with the required information to update our model so that we can foresee with more accuracy changes in the climate and weather patterns. To diversify our set of measuring tools, we now use bioindicators such as algae and fish to assess water quality in catchment areas. This recently awarded initiative portrays a groundbreaking idea in Colombia's water sector by translating academic research into sustainable business practices. Third, we mitigate our contribution to climate change by managing our carbon footprint. We are the only water and sewerage company in Colombia to have been certified as carbon neutral. 
thanks to our investments aimed at measuring, reducing and compensating our emissions. For example, we have built small hydropower plants to use the energy created through water distribution infrastructure. These two projects, Santa Ana and Usaken, were certified under the Clean Development Mechanisms for Reducing Emissions. Fourth, we are fully determined to strengthen our adaptation capacity to climate change. Our sound commitment to protecting hydrological sources and carbon sinks, such as forests, is to remain the flagship of our endeavors on this end. To provide some perspective, our 100-year efforts to stewarding this territory translates into an accrued ownership of land roughly equivalent to half the size of Singapore. Finally, we are changing the way we operate by integrating sustainability criteria to our new projects. The new wastewater treatment plant Canoas, one of the largest to be Latin America, was conceived as a recovery plant rather than just a treatment plant. It is expected that it will make the most of 97% of the biogas produced to cogenerate and it will place a special importance to the reuse of biosolids. On the other hand, a discussion on sustainability and resilience cannot neglect a deep thought on water losses. Observing the levels they attain in Latin American cities, where they reach the startling figure of 40%, should make us really think of the importance we are attributing to water as a scarce resource. Just to give some perspective, oil losses are around 0.3%. Why shouldn't we aim at anything less than this figure when it comes to water? I would like to finish by saying that this is not a matter of, of if urban water resilience is attainable or not. It is a matter of when and how. The worst scenario is where no one acts. Therefore, we need to pull resources and work together in what shouldn't be a different path than that of attaining urban water resilience. Thank you very much for inviting Sabespi to participate in this session on how to stay ahead of the wave. And we feel very honored to be considered as a global resilience uh, champion. Uh, Sabesp is a very large utility company that operates in the state of Sao Paulo, Brazil, serving uh, 375 municipalities with water supply and sanitation. And we have around uh, 28 million uh, customers. So uh, resilience is a very important subject in SABESP because we have uh, to provide reliable service 24-7 uh, with good water quality to a large number of clients and to uh, provide health and quality of living. Uh, the extreme drought that hit the metropolitan region of Sao Paulo back in 2014, 2015, posed a very difficult challenge to us uh, since we had uh, to provide water to 22 million people during the worst drought of our history. So many lessons uh, were learned and uh, I think the most important of them was to increase resilience in our water supply uh, systems. So uh, to do that, I think that uh, the lessons can be, we, I think we can think of four lessons. And uh, the first of them was the importance of redundancy in our uh, water supply systems. Uh, we recognize that redundancy uh, requires large investments but uh, in the end, it pays off. 
and we, invest, we invested in uh, redundant, redundant systems that, for instance, right now, uh, we are uh, currently, they are currently being used uh, because we are having uh, rainfall below average for the last uh, for last for the last several months, and uh, I think that the second lesson is uh, was to increase the operational flexibility in the systems in order to optimize the water distribution. It also uh, requires uh, large investments but is worth it. I think it's, it, it, it's a very important measure that it's, it, uh, it's making our life much easier right now. Uh, the third lesson is uh, how important it is to bring uh, people together, to bring uh, the population together uh, to reduce the consumption. And uh, I think that transparency in communication uh, is really uh, very important, but it's also important uh, to provide tips and information on how to better use uh, water in, uh, in houses, in, uh, in restaurants, in hotels, uh, in commerce in general. The, in the 2014-15 the drought, we had a reduction around 15% uh, in the consumption. And this reduction is still in place uh, today. So we are down 15% uh, of the consumption in comparison of the, the, the consumption that uh, we had before. Uh, Fines and other penalty measures uh, can also play an important role, but tariffs must be managed very, very uh, carefully in, not, in, in order not uh, to cause any damage to the finances of the company in a time where uh, investment uh, is so important it's so badly uh, needed. So I think that uh, building resilience is uh, we it's is to put in place uh, different measures that uh, at the final <laughs> at, at the fi as as uh, and, and our final target is to uh, reduce water consumption to make water consumption more. Uh, rational, but it also requires investment. And uh, so I, I know it's very difficult to manage that in many places uh, around the world, but we really have to think that those investments are necessary and uh, they will make a big difference. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you again for uh, inviting us uh, to be in this session. Thank you. My name is Yvonne Eki Sawyer, and I'm the mayor of Freetown, the capital city of Sierra Leone. Urban water resilience is one of the main cha major challenges that we face in the midst of the global pandemic, as well as climate change. Global pandemic, because water has been such an important factor in the prevention of COVID, and it's really brought to light how important this is to everyday life and to other epidemics, pandemics that may face us in the coming years. Climate change, because one of the devastating impacts of climate change is either too much water or too little water. Flooding, deforestation, but all the while, water is critical for life and for health. So we must make it a priority. And in answering the question, of urban water resilience. The question, first of all, that we must tackle is how do we protect existing water sources? Water sources are under challenge from deforestation. They're under challenge from contamination. They're under challenge from in, inappropriate building. Um, and they're 
on the challenge from poor sanitation, which again comes back to the contamination issue, there is a focus that needs to be had from all city leaders and other stakeholders in ensuring that those water sources are protected. Because if you don't have the water, then the question of distribution of water becomes irrelevant. In Freetown, one of the things that we're doing to address the rapid um, depletion of our water sources is Freetown the Tree Town, the planting of a million trees, where those trees are targeted around not just slope stabilization, but around water catchment areas, ensuring that we are providing the tree cover, which is so essential to keeping those water sources um, available for this generation and the next. But it goes beyond that. Our waterways are being polluted with poor sanitation. Um, our waterways are also being polluted with contamination from industry. Our oceans are being contaminated from, again, plastic and other forms of pollution. So the protection element is going to be something that we cannot lose sight of. But it goes beyond that. Once we've talked about protecting the waterways, we must also ensure that everyone has access. And here, like with everything else, when you talk about cities, you recognize, we must recognize the vast difference between different cities and the authority the different city, city leaderships have. Some cities have responsible responsibility for on-grid and off-grid water sources. In some cities, off-grid isn't even a question because everyone's on the grid. But that is another point which increasingly, particularly in the Global South, um, we have to be alive to. If we say that SDGs means we leave no one behind, then water is one of those, one of those elements, really critical elements that must be addressed in respect of leaving no one behind. And for many, many cities, that means off grid solutions as well as on grid. So what we do in the coming years in ensuring that people have access, as we're doing in Freetown, rainwater harvesting, water kiosks, these are some interventions, but they're not enough. Water is a major challenge. And for us to address that challenge, investment is required, considerable financial investment. And for that to happen, cities need to be able to access that resource. So the how, the why, the why is because water is life. In terms of can we attain urban water, urban urban water resilience, I would put it differently. I would say we must attain urban water resilience and we've all got a part to play to ensure that we protect, to ensure that we distribute, to ensure that we have the finances for the investments, to look at nature-based solutions that will create a better outcome in the long run, a more sustainable outcome. This is a challenging time, but we mustn't back away from the challenge. This can be done and must be done, and we've got to work together. Thank you. Yes, uh, welcome, um, Sheila Patel. It's a really a uh, pleasure to be with you. And thanks for accepting to share your experience about urban water resilience, in uh, especially in uh, low-income uh, urban areas where you've been working a lot in your life. But please, could you introduce yourself and tell us a bit about the work you're doing? So my name is Sheila Patel. I'm based in Mumbai in India. I founded an organization in 1985 that sought to work in serious long-term partnerships with organizations of the urban poor. So we call ourselves the Alliance of Spark, Mahila Milan and NSTF, basically saying that the quest for equity and visibility and voice in cities for the poor is not going to come automatically. It's going to come out of building strength, aggregated evidence and new forms of solutions for poor people to present to cities so that duty bearers in the city the state and globally begin to look at addressing these issues more seriously than all the empty words we've been hearing. So that's who I am. And I was part of the founders of Shack or Slum Dwellers International, or STI as we call ourselves, in 1996, 
where now we have 33 countries and over three to 500 cities in which we work. Oh, very impressive. Thanks a lot for, for this. Uh, and I will go directly into the, the main question. Uh, do you think, uh, Sheila, that uh, urban water resilience for all today, according to your vision and your experience, is it a utopia or is it a reality? Well, I think uh, it's, it's a reality in the world I live in because nobody can live without water. Uh, I think the development world is much more comfortable saying it's utopian because they are not serious about it. Uh, I've been part of the discussions of the World Water Week in the 70s and the 80s when it was seen as just a engineering feat. Lots of money was put, no water came to poor people. So it depends on who you're looking at. But if today in the context of climate change and in the era of COVID, if we are serious about the challenges of social justice and equity, then we should leave all this rhetoric of utopia and get down to business to say, in the next 10 years, what do we need to do to ensure that water, food, energy, and other issues related to equity are accessible to all? So the quest is what you're looking for. Utopia is for dreamers. We are not dreamers. All right. So do you, you suggest that uh, some people are, are still dreaming about it and uh, they're not getting there and getting down to it uh, completely? What I feel is that my work has shown me that solutions don't come magically out of some research done by you sitting in Stockholm or somebody sitting in Washington. You have to have the guts to actually work, talk and produce solutions with people whose lives revolve around stealing water, paying 20 times more than what you pay for water, and to understand what it means in their lives. If you don't understand that, and you don't develop a passion for it, then you just have empty words, uh, you throw money around to do more research, uh, you don't take a long-term stand to produce solutions that are long-term. But Sheila, do you believe that still there is some kind of a trend going more towards, uh, uh, you know, more uh, f people focus or are still far behind? You know, uh, in the beginning when this whole COVID crisis began last year, there was a general echoing of saying we can't go back to the way we were. We have to produce a new normal. We have to do something better. Uh, and now one and a half years later, as I see everybody conveniently going back to their comfortable positions. <laughs> so talk is cheap. That's good. So that's exactly uh, uh, maybe you can give us some key messages, uh, uh, Sheila. What, what would be your one or two key messages you want to give to the participants of the Stockholm Water Week today who will be listening uh, to us? You know, my organization and I have come into this climate space kicking and screaming because you're so worried about evictions and stopping evictions and getting people basic amenities that we didn't see climate change until it hit us in the face and we began to reformulate the challenges that poor people face within the climate space. Now, there is nothing more dramatically different in our lives than water. I used to be on the Global Commission for Adaptation as one of the 33 members. I learned a lot in that process. First thing I learned is that most global discussions really don't embrace the reality of cities and the poor. And all the discussions are like two centuries old. So the first thing I realized is that the world, that the planet is already water scarce. And it's going to get worse because we are destroying our basic water sources. There is going to be desertification. So at a macro level, we know that there are going to be more wars to control water. We know that the rich are going to get hold of all the water that they can or they will use technology to get themselves water and leave the poor out. 
So the first thing is, for those who are discussing water in the climate space, what are the things that they have to think about at the planetary level, but also at the local level? In most of our cities, 30 to 50 percent of water is wasted through leakages because the water systems are inadequate, but they are also very old. In my city, there was a time when it was 45 percent leakage. So you have to cut the leaks. You also have to stop the stealing of water. There's a lot of stealing of water. A lot of water is stolen and sold to poor people by the bucket. So you pay for one bucket of water. What people like you and me living formally will pay for gallons. And that water is stolen from the city. The third very important thing is that the business of conserving, reusing, and caring for water is everybody's business. The poor will already take that very seriously. So how can the new age, technology, science, uh, engineering, with their advances, what can they do with a very clear commitment of a benefit for universality? Mm. Because right now, when they think about cities, they only think about the formal city. Mm. And the last two things are that all cities are drawing water from their peripheries. Yes. And they are destroying the ecology of those places. And there is nobody fighting for their rights. So those are my starting messages. And the other thing is we are all ready with data, with commitments, with organized poor to explore new solutions. And so thank you very much, Sheila, for this uh, intervention. Thank you very much, uh, Sheila. Thank you. Thank you. Good day, everyone. I am Eva Clemente, Head of Strategic Asset Management in Manila Water. I am in charge of the development of the water and wastewater master plans for existing and future assets of the company in line with business objectives and for our services to the 7 million people in our concession area. We provide water and wastewater services to 23 cities and municipalities in the eastern parts of Metro Manila and the province of Rizal. We operate in a country visited by an average of 20 storms a year, of which five are often destructive. We know that our operations and the lives of those we serve are intrinsically vulnerable to climate change. Mindful of this, we are the first Philippine company to articulate a climate change policy in 2007 ahead of national directives. Our climate change policy formalizes commitments to climate change adaptation via resilient assets and operations, proactive water source development, and other climate change mitigation efforts, including energy efficiency, minimizing carbon footprint, and strengthening stakeholder partnerships. In our 24 years of operations, we have risen over many climate change setbacks by building in resiliency in our assets and operations informed by vulnerability assessments and actual experience. When Typhoon Quetzana struck in 2009, our concession area was submerged in massive flooding. It was a 1 in 150 years rainfall event. At that time, it took us about 20 days to fully restore water service. We have since revised asset standards, retrofitted assets, and designed new infrastructure to enable flood-resilient operations. Two of our facilities won international awards for innovative, flood-resistant design. Through operational efficiencies, we have provided 24 by 7 water supply year after year despite the absence of an additional water source. 
The summer of 2019, however, was different. We had a water crisis as El Nino brought very little rainfall and our reservoirs reached levels below average. Manila Water's crisis management team methodically restored services by implementing augmentation and distribution plans, including pressure management to equitably distribute available supply, temporary use of deep wells, and acceleration of much-needed water source projects. With improved coordination with government, customers, as well as the supply chain, 24 by 7 service was eventually restored to regulatory standard. To us, the resiliency of assets and disaster risk reduction and management are interconnected and integral to business continuity. Through these, Manila Water prepares and helps the company, our employees, government, and our stakeholders before and during natural disasters. Coupled with business continuity and interoperability protocols, simulated and pre-agreed internally and with stakeholders much, much ahead of time, we have been quicker in restoring services. When Typhoon Ulysses came in 2020, it was like Ketsana all over again. This time, we have become better and quicker. We were able to fully restore services across all affected in less than a week. We continue to educate, communicate, and calibrate strategies towards strengthening our maturity in resilience and business continuity as we extend support and respond to the call to mitigate the impacts of climate change. Bien, bonjour à tous, Sylvain Berrios, je suis vice-président de la métropole du Grand Paris. Euh, maire de Saint-Maur-des-Fossés, c'est une commune qui se situe dans le Val-de-Marne, dans la dernière boucle que la Marne fait avant de se jeter dans la Seine, symbole de cette, de cette eau qui irrigue la métropole du Grand Paris, plus de 7 millions d'habitants, 131 communes, avec, comme je l'indiquais, un grand fleuve que, la Seine, que chacun connaît, c'est la Seine, qui traverse Paris, euh, mais également euh, la Marne, qui est une rivière non moins grande, se jette dans la Seine et puis euh, plein d'affluents. On peut parler par exemple du Morbra, de, de la Hier, bref, euh, une ville et une métropole d'eau. Euh, pendant longtemps, la métropole euh, a tourné le dos à sa rivière, euh, à son fleuve. Euh, et puis euh, au bout d'un certain temps, mine de rien, euh, les habitants, comme les responsables politiques, se sont dit que finalement, si on habitait près de l'eau, c'était qu'il y avait probablement une raison. Et la bonne raison, c'est qu'effectivement, c'est constitutif de la vie et constitutif même de l'espace urbain et de l'origine de cet espace urbain. Et euh, c'est une bonne chose aujourd'hui, tout le monde, euh, ou presque, en tout cas j'espère tout le monde, est convaincu euh, qu'il faut être très attentif à l'eau, parce qu'en étant attentif à l'eau, on est finalement attentif à ce qui l'entoure et au milieu urbain. Et cette métropole résiliente, cette métropole qui est attentive à son environnement. Euh, l'eau, c'est le premier symbole de cet environnement. Lorsque l'eau est propre, ça signifie que l'urbanisation qui l'entoure a rendu possible cette propreté de l'eau et qu'on vit dans un milieu sain. La résilience, c'est la capacité à maîtriser eh bien, les inondations qui sont le fruit de la nature. Il ne s'agit pas de l'accueillir avec joie, mais il s'agit d'être capable de l'accueillir ensuite avec toutes les possibilités pour que la vie puisse continuer à aller sans trop de dégâts pour les habitants et que les habitants puissent continuer à vivre sans crainte de la rivière ou du fleuve. Alors comment rendre une métropole résiliente eh C'est avoir communément des schémas d'aménagement et de gestion des eaux qui rendent possible la vie en commun euh, avec cette eau, avec des objectifs partagés, euh, celui bien sûr du paysage, celui de la propreté, euh, celui de la durabilité, celui euh, qui permet d'anticiper euh, des grandes crises d'inondation euh, et aussi euh, d'avoir euh, une réflexion sur le paysage urbain, euh, sur notre capacité encore une fois à vivre au bord de l'eau euh, parce que dans la métropole du Grand Paris, mais comme en France, plus de 90% des habitants vivent près de l'eau. Euh, et imaginer qu'on puisse l'ignorer, euh, c'est faire une erreur historique en matière urbaine. Euh, L'eau, c'est la nature, la nature est têtue, 
euh, et soyons résolus à faire en sorte que notre bien commun, notre environnement puisse être non pas maîtrisé, euh, mais euh, au contraire euh, anticipé pour que chacun puisse y vivre de façon le plus agréable, en sécurité euh, et de façon euh, durable. Voilà la métropole du Grand Paris et ce qu'est la métropole du Grand Paris résiliente. Alors bien sûr, une métropole résiliente, c'est une métropole qui protège et donc ils vont faire en sorte que notre capacité à protéger les habitants et à organiser la vie et l'économie de l'espace de telle sorte que même lorsqu'il y a des grandes inondations, eh bien on puisse continuer à vivre, est un élément important. C'est aussi des éléments de conviction convaincre les populations que eh bien, la rivière ou les fleuves euh, sont des éléments naturels euh, qu'il faut reconquérir euh, avec tout ce que j'ai dit, tout, tout ce que j'indique souvent, c'est-à-dire la capacité euh, à boire l'eau, euh, la capacité à avoir du loisir sur l'eau, la capacité à avoir de l'économie sur l'eau avec nos zones portuaires, et puis euh, un objectif qui nous rassemble tous euh, sur la métropole du Grand Paris, mais partout en Europe, c'est notre possibilité de, de s'y baigner. C'est un élément fondamental parce que le jour où on se baigne, ça signifie que la métropole est résiliente. La baignade est un objectif qui emporte tous les objectifs, symbole d'une métropole résiliente. Et c'est ce que nous faisons, nous, avec un big jump métropolitain qui a lieu chaque mois de juillet, le deuxième week-end de chaque mois de juillet. Et il y a encore quelques semaines, moi-même, je me baignais dans la Marne. Voilà des beaux objectifs et euh, je crois que chacun d'entre nous, partout dans le monde, euh, ce sont des objectifs que nous pouvons euh, épouser avec, euh, avec bonheur, joie et espérance. So, um, welcome uh, Mrs. Art Sancter Lemberg. Uh, so maybe Santia, could you maybe start to ex uh, present yourself, who you are, what is your, your, your position and what you're doing in uh, Cape Town? Well, good morning and thank you for the opportunity. Um, my name is Xanthia Limburg. I am a city councillor um, mm -hmm. and serve as the mayoral committee member responsible for water sanitation and waste services within the city of Cape Town municipality. Um, and I have been in uh, this particular portfolio uh, since 2017, uh, but served as a councillor for close on a decade. All right, so thank you very much uh, uh, for that, uh, Xantia. So I will go immediately into the, the topic um, um, For you, Xantia, is urban water resilience a utopia or a reality? Can you give us some sense about uh, what you think about this question? Well, that's an interesting question, and I think a question which many cities across the world have uh, asked um, themselves or have grappled with um the ability to achieve urban resilience mm -hmm. i believe um honestly that it is a reality however um it is a reality that is incredibly challenging to achieve it's an incredibly ambitious um, vision um, because the urban water system is uh, so complex uh, so interlinked and intertwined and dynamic uh, in, in form and nature. Um, and so even though, yes, urban water resilience uh, can be achievable and can form part of our lived uh, reality, it is something that requires a significant amount of effort and time, as well as um, the necessary and adequate financial resources, the strengthening of uh, institutions and capacity as well as building trust with um, one's citizens and key uh, partners and stakeholders and ensuring that there are strong working relationships that encourage collaboration. And so all of those uh, factors, I think, need to be strongly embedded in order to be able to work towards achieving uh, true urban water resilience. Thank you, Santiago. You know very well that uh, Cape Town has been in the news 
a few years ago and uh, we were all uh, breathing with uh, you and uh, you know thinking you know and it was really a, I remember an amazing moment and but what would you say made the difference to to actually uh, make the step forward and be able to actually go go more towards resilience what was the magic trick that you saw that make things happen well, Cape Town um, has just um, slowly emerged out of uh, its worst drought in the record of the, the city. Uh, it's mm -hmm. been described uh, by scientists as a one in 590 year event. Um, so that really highlights the truly unprecedented nature of this particular drought. And I would say the success of being able to effectively manage and overcome a crisis such as the drought that Cape Town experienced is not solely based on being able to take rapid action and implement immediate interventions, but also about being able to utilize existing resources, skills and abilities that have been invested in over time within the municipality. Uh, for example, in the case of the city, um, our water department over an extended period of time uh, built a strong solid foundation um, around water conservation, water demand management. And it is for this reason, I think investing in doing the basics right should not be underestimated as this form a key and critical part of Cape Town's success in navigate, navigating the, the drought. Uh, but more importantly, it was also a joint effort between government and its citizens, as well as other uh, key influential stakeholders uh, and that ongoing working relationship um, enhanced communication efforts I think also uh, very successfully um, allowed Cape Town to be able to reduce its consumption by close on 60 percent in a three-year period which is a world record in itself mm -hmm. um, but Beyond just being able to manage the drought uh, based on our uh, history of water demand management, um, we also took the opportunity of the drought and we um, took a moment to learn from the lessons of that drought. And those lessons we then used to inform a different water future for Cape Town. Um, and we took those lessons and we translated it into action through the formulation of a new water strategy mm -hmm. and that water strategy sets out five commitments that we make to our residents but one of the most important ones is about um, essentially transitioning Cape Town into becoming a uh, resilient uh, city by 2030 and a water sensitive city by 2040. Mm -hmm. All of these things are going to be uh, incredibly challenging to achieve but it's a vision um, and, an, and a commitment that we um, are, are focused on achieving and we know we won't be able to do it on our own. And so uh, we will walk this journey with our residents uh, as well as local and uh, international partners across the globe. Thank you very much, Xantia. Uh, that was really very interesting. Uh... Welcome, uh, Kathleen Brubach. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, maybe uh, for our participants, it would be good that you introduce yourself first and what you're doing, the fantastic uh, work that you're doing on resident cities. Thank you, Francois. It's a, it's a, it's a true pleasure to be um, with you this morning, and it's even a, a, a bigger pleasure and honor to um, have um, the World Water Week putting cities at at the, the head of the agenda. So my name is Katrin Pulbach. I'm the Global Director of Programs, Innovation and Impact at the Resilient Cities Network. We are a network organization, as our name says, uh, working with 100 cities around the world, um, supporting them and working with them and for them in building urban resilience. When I first uh, saw your organization, uh, you know, when you see the name Resilient Cities Network, it's quite... Um, appealing, you know, it is exactly right on our topic. So um, it looks like you have the solutions of all the problems just by looking at the title, you know. So but 
What do you mean by resilient cities uh, in your network? What is it that you mean? So, so first of all, I think if we would have all the solutions to all the problems, I think um, most probably I wouldn't sit here. I would uh, yeah. most probably drive my Porsche through uh, wherever, or maybe a Tesla because that's more climate friendly. Um, no, so so um, I I think we we don't have the solutions, but we are very keen to find the solutions to build urban resilience. And we, we recognize that uh, to find solutions to build resilience, um, you need to have a network of people and a network of cities to do so. Right. So, so this is, this is why, um, why we... Um, so would you say that the 97 cities that you're working with are, are resilient cities? They definitely are resilient cities, yeah. but... Good. but um, why, do, why would you say that? <laughs> So they are resilient cities um, because they have, they recognize and they truly believe that they have to build urban resilience to, um, to survive and to thrive in future. So just to be clear, it doesn't mean that they are resilient, resilient as an end state. That means that they um, started their journey in a very individual way um, in addressing the shocks and stresses they face and, and uh, try to identify solutions and actions to um, respond to them. So that means that resilience is not an end state, it's it's a process. What are the ingredients of that process? So I, I think the ingredients of this process are ground in, in what, what, what resilience means in the sense of that if you want to build resilience, you need to look at a system because like, like uh, usually co only complex systems can become more resilient. And um, that means if we look at the system, you look at uh, multiple moving parts in a city. So you're looking at the people, you're looking at institutions, you're looking at businesses, you're looking at subsystems. So you're looking at the transport system, you're looking at the water system, you're looking at the energy system, you're looking at nature, you're looking at the biodiversity. So all these, these uh, mm -hmm. moving parts in a city comprise the city as a system. And when we talk about um, resilience, we are talking about how do we actually make this system stronger and how do we um, um, build out the capacity of the system to respond to shocks and stresses okay, and to so make that, it better. That, that sounds really very interesting. So it's really a holistic vision of uh, the actual urban development we are talking about. Exactly. And now you, you've, you've heard uh, just before you, we had uh, champions, uh, uh, from different parts of the world expressing themselves. So what, 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 what did you get from that discussion from our different uh, people who, who came before you on that video? Um, so, so I was, I, I must, must admit, I was truly impressed by, um, by all the information, all these amazing examples. And yes, I think, yes. um, um, I think it, it reflects what resilience is all about. So first of all, there is not only one solution to the problem. So we have seen so many different um, um, solutions, proposals on how to build resilience. And I think that is that is at the core. You heard the very strong message from uh, Sheila Patel and saying, you know, we are, we are talking about uh, resilience, we're talking about urban development, but uh, we are not completely in reality because she says, you know, uh, if you look at reality, you look at in cities, in most uh, developing countries, urban poverty is really one of the main components. You know, you've got low income areas uh, can reach 50, maybe even sometimes more than 50 percent of the inhabitants. And she feels like we are out of touch on, uh, on this reality. What would you say to that? <laughs> I, I, I totally agree. Um, <laughs> but but I think or oh, actually, no, there is no but. So resilience is about people and people are at the center. Yeah. And I think this is this is specifically, and I, I'm allowed to say that engineers need to recognize that it's not only about the technology and innovations. And, and you know, experts tend to talk about it. it's at the end of the day, it's about the people. And yeah. resilience is about the most vulnerable parts of your system. So so resilience is to uh, resilience is about understanding where your risks and vulnerabilities are. And if we look around the world. Um, uh, we only can uh, build resilience when we recognize what the vulner most vulnerable parts of our system are. And if we are talking about people and if we talk about vulnerability, we have to talk, talk about poverty. 
we, we are here at World Water Week. Um, we know that the water and sanitation crisis is not a new one. You know, we have failed over the last decades to make the progress we were actually anticipating. So now yes. we are talking about resilience. We are talking about responding to shocks and stress and stresses on top of having 800 million people not having access to sanitation. So, and I think this is something we recognize. Resilience is not something new. It's not this new flashy topic. We are talking about it now because all of us lived through a crisis for the last one and a half years. So we all believe that we are experts on that. But, but we have to recognize that we haven't done our job in the past. And it's not about moving to another topic just because we are not solving one issue. We need to look at holistically at that and we need to see not only the failures and the risks and vulnerabilities, but we need to understand them to de develop the solutions to address them. And, and furthermore, we, we, um, we have to recognize that the poor and the vulnerable is not a responsibility or something we, we, we have to do it. It's an opportunity and it's our goddamn responsibility to, to, yeah. to, to, to make their lives better because a resilient city and a resilient system is, is, a, is a system that, um, that fosters inclusion, that, that is truly equitable. And, and, and it's not only about infrastructure, it's not only about innovation, it's about people, it's about the human rights um, um, to everyone. And I think this is what resilience is about. Yeah, so if you had just one very key message to give to our participants, where would that be? It's a difficult question. <laughs> it's, um, we can't do it alone. And the water, the water sector is not solving the problem. We need to recognize that if we want to build a resilient world, we, we need to talk to everybody, we need to work together, and we need to find solutions that address multiple problems Perfect. at the same time. So that would be a very, very good conclusion. Thank you so much, Catherine, for this so conversation. And uh, we wish you all the best. And uh, please stay with us uh, during the week. It would be really great uh, to have your point of views on what is happening. Thank you very much. I will definitely do so. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.